Hello and welcome to today's Movers and Shakers virtual event, which is actually part of the Bristol Housing Festival and is in partnership with Regeneration Brainery. My name is Lena Tasha Salter and I'm Managing Director of Movers and Shakers. For those of you who don't know Movers and Shakers, we're the UK's leading property networking forum. We've been going for 25 years, putting together great high level events, forums and conferences for the industry, bringing together the private and public sector leaders to network and do business. We've been holding our virtual events since April of this year. We're really enjoying our event schedule. We'll be doing much more of them. And if you've missed any of these events, including some of our events with Regeneration Brainery, you can watch them on our YouTube channel. So please do take a look, enjoy and subscribe. So today we've got an interview with a leader with a bit of a difference. So first of all, I'd like to welcome Marvin Rees, who is the mayor of Bristol, of course, and he is going to be interviewed today by five brainies from Regeneration Brainery. So what is Regeneration Brainery? Well, they're a not-for-profit organization that connects young people to the property and construction industry. Their mission is to make our industry inclusive, to include some of these bright young minds. They introduce the brainies to mentors that help them navigate our industry and help them understand the diverse career opportunities ahead of them. So it's a fantastic organization and Movers and Shakers is delighted to be supporting them. And we welcome our five brainies today. Now, as I said, this is part of the Bristol Housing Festival, which is virtual this year. And it's run from the 12th of October until the 1st of November. And it's a series of industry leading events focused on housing and construction. So there's still time for you to view more of the events. So do go and look at what they do. And they've got panel sessions and debates linking together private sector leaders in housing and construction, the public sector, local governments, residents and communities. And they're showcasing some of the latest housing innovations from current projects, from past projects. And it's a really great initiative. So please do take a look and we can give you more information if you'd like. So today I welcome, as I said, Mayor Marvin and our brainies, Melanie, Neve, Bella, Becca and Adam. And they are gonna be quizzing Marvin on his plans for house building. And also they're gonna be quizzing him on the opportunities that lie ahead for them. So I welcome Marvin, thank you so much for joining us today. And I, I know you've got a really busy schedule, so we do appreciate it. And our brainies will appear and I'm gonna let Bella, when they've all come on, open the conversation. Thank you very much indeed, enjoy. Hi, my name is Bella and I'm a brainy with Regeneration Brainery. So Regeneration Brainery inspires young people to work in property and construction by connecting us with mentors who talk about what it's really like. I'm currently in year 13 at a school in Bristol and I'm hoping to study real estate in the future. Hi, my name is Adam. I've just started my first year at UE Bristol and I'm studying urban planning. We're worried about what happens afterwards there. Will there be jobs for us? Hi, my name is Neve, and I'm also studying urban planning at UE Bristol. Thank you to the Bristol Housing Festival for inviting us along. It is the first time Regeneration Brainery has Facebook lived an event. Hi, my name is Melanie and I am studying architecture at Liverpool University. I would like to welcome everybody today to our interview with Marvin Rees, Mayor of Bristol. Hi, I'm Becca and I'm doing a degree apprenticeship in building services engineering. Hello, Marvin. Hi, you okay? Yeah, so, good. Marvin, our first question is, what does the Mayor do? <laughs> So it's really varied. I've just got off a call to a primary school, actually, with um, a whole class asking me questions. Uh, first thing this morning, I was writing a letter to a member of the royal household. Um, we're preparing. I then talked to our head of legal about the elections next year and how we're going to manage them in the, in the face of COVID, because local authority is responsible. But they, 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 there's lots of different levels. There's a the city level. Uh, um, and... Uh, obviously working within Bristol, trying to shape the direction of the city. And that's an important area to understand. It's not just, and the, the mayoral role is not just about the city council, which is what the old leader model was, where the councillors get together and choose and vote amongst themselves who the political leader is going to be. You could end up with 16 people choosing a political leader for the city because it's just the councillors, directly elected mayors for the city. 
So it is about the authority, but it's about working with the wider city, the health service, the police, the universities, businesses over, over whom you have no control, but you have to create space for people to come together. Then there's a level in which we're trying to work nationally. And you see that increasingly, obviously over the last few days with Andy Burnham speaking, um, uh, you know, most prominently and Sadiq Khan's, you, you know, got that platform. I did stuff over the summer. So you can see that the mayoral role is much more about shaping national policy as well, but also internationally. So I sit on the Mayor's Migration Council. I sit on the Global Parliament. The mayors were members of Euro cities. So we, 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 we shape um, national and international uh, policy uh, uh, as well. So it's a new kind of political leadership in the country, actually, relatively new. Okay, so you spoke nationally there. And in, in 2017, the Sunday Times called Bristol Britain's most livable city. And a few weeks ago, Nick Walkley from Homes England said Bristol was the best city to invest in in the UK. So what is Bristol doing right? So it does offer a good standard of living. Um, we, you know, lots of green space, you know, just it's a, the, the train connections from London are fantastic for people moving from London. We're attracting uh, very attractive businesses. Channel 4 have chosen Bristol to be its new home. So they've, they've got a new HQ in um, Leeds, but they've got um, creative hubs in Glasgow and Bristol. Those were very competitive processes. All those things create a sense of excitement with the cultural offer uh, within the city um, as well. Um, I'd say, I just always put this in, it's important that um, to recognize that we're a city of contradictions as well. So. Um, about 20, 20 to twenty five percent of our children in Bristol are at risk of hunger. Right, this is not okay. Right, tens of thousands of people are not a, not a part of this amazing story that's on offer. Um, so I always have to, to say that. But and that's what we're trying to tackle. But what we've done, which hopefully makes Bristol attractive, is one was we've really been open and pretty ferocious about our political intentions to get stuff built here. Um, you see the you know. Like, I get this line, what's Marvin done? I said to someone the other day, you see that massive crane on the end of Castle Park? <laughs> the tallest crane in the city. You see all the construction around, you see all the bar. Stuff's getting built, right? The end of M32, how could you miss that stuff? Right? Um, so we've made it a real political intention to get stuff done and to work very constructively with, um, with the private sector to get, to get stuff done. But then what we've also done is been very clear about what we're trying to get done. What we're not trying to do is create more opportunity for people that have already got opportunity. We want to be ambitious, but we need to tackle inequality. We need to tackle those vulnerabilities to future pandemics, climate change. We need to build nature in the face of the ecological uh, crisis. These are all things that we are saying, if you want to come with us and work with us on that, we'll work as best as we possibly can. And I, and I think that that's made us quite attractive, I guess. Um so is there anything that you'd like to change or what would, what would you change in Bristol? Oh, the, the inequality within Bristol is, is our, and the fractures that, that, um, that underpins race and class fractures across the city. These are, these are hugely significant. We, we, you know, we have, um, we're, one of the, we're the only city outside the Southeast to make, make a net contribution to the treasury. And yet we have six areas in the top 1% most deprived in England. It's remarkable inequality within Bristol. Over 40 in the top 10% most deprived. And you know what those areas are if you're from Bristol. It's the Hartcliffe, Lawrence Western, um, Withywoods, Southmead, Lockleys, Lawrence Hill. Lock, you know, they're pretty, Avonmouth is pretty uh, straightforward to identify um, uh, these areas. So I, I think that that scale of inequality in a city like Bristol is, is an embarrassment. Um, but what I've been proud of is that the city is no longer shying away from that. I, I, I've always felt that Bristol liked to talk about balloons, bridges and Brunel, but never really dealt with the fact that children in the city are growing up hungry. Um, and, but we have made inclusion and tackling poverty. We, last year, we ran a big campaign around period poverty that Helen Godwin led. Amazing company stepped up. We did a whole drive to recruit foster families. We started to think about those people that are too easily left behind by our phenomenal economic success. And I think that gives the city integrity. Um, so technology is changing property and construction processes. Um, so where do you think the jobs will be in five years time? 
but they have to be moving to the green economy. Um, I, I've been, one of the points I've been making to government over the last, well, for a while, but certainly uh, ramped it up recently, was as we faced the economic, the biggest economic depression in since the 1930s, that what government should do is front load its investment in green infrastructure. Uh, we want to build, we want to regenerate uh, Temple Meads. Um, the new university campus behind that is a half billion pound um, construction project. Temple Island is 350 million pound. Our mass transit system that we we're working on at the moment is, is over four billion pounds. We haven't dug a hole yet, so you know it's going to go up. Uh, Hengrove Park is, you know, like 1,200 homes. There's so much, and, and on that, we need to rebuild our city systems, right? So we need to de we need to decarbonize transport. We need to decarbonize our waste system, decarbonize our energy system, and find a way of building nature uh, natural into our re re redesigned cities. My point to government is front load the investment in all that. It's billions of pounds. It gives us confidence in the economy. It generates jobs. And we begin benefiting from that decarbonisation sooner uh, rather than later. Don't keep local authorities guessing, which seems to be the way national government works all the time, waiting the night before for the latest, for the latest press release coming out. We need certainty. Uh, but greening the economy um, is going to be absolutely essential. It would also help us tackle uh, poverty alongside the environmental movement and the environmental movement has not historically been very good at taking poverty into account. Last week we talked to Chris Bowie Hill who's the director of innovation at engineering firm Hydrock. He talked about modular housing. If Bristol builds using modular building methods will we need new skills and if so where will we learn these skills? We do need uh, new skills to do that, but we, we've we been quite on the front end of that, and I'm not going to take any credit for it. We just backed amazing people. Um, Jeremy Sweetland um, runs the Bristol Housing Festival. And uh, it, again, if you're in Bristol, um, you can have a look. If you go by St. George's Park, um, just at the top of Church Road, you'll see, I think, it's 11 Z pods that have been built on stilts above a car park. So the car park is still available for people to go and park there at the park, but there's the air above it is obviously not being used. So we've um, just the housing festivals come together with us because our car park at the YMCA and those Z pods, which are zero carbon homes are gonna be available to young people at risk of homelessness. It's incredible. Right, right next to Bristol Met School, there's Launchpad as well, which is um, uh, United um, uh, Bristol Housing Festival um, and uh, University of Bristol actually. And uh, amazing, these kind of containerized homes that have been put together on an old car park again uh, for students to move into with uh, young people, um, you know, at risk of falling out of society. So uh, there is some amazing um, stuff happening in the city. Book lock schemes come through as well with Skanska built on Airport Road. Um, so, but yeah, we will need those new skills. I, I, again, if I say to government, if government front loads the investment and says, okay, we are gonna give you a bankable partnership and this is gonna be your trajectory of delivery over the next uh, 10 years, then we can, we can talk to City of Bristol College, UE, University of Bristol, get the apprenticeships going and build the skills because we know the jobs will be there in four years. So it's the certainty um, that we want. And then our local skills um, suppliers of skills will, will be able to orient themselves towards that, those economic opportunities. We thought that if Bristol built a modular factory in Avonmouth industrial site, it would make sense as it's well connected to motorways and there's lots of space. What do you think? I think it's a fantastic idea. We, we, we are looking at um, opportunities to build a modular um, factory. I think the challenge around modular at the moment is about the scale of demand. They got to have enough demand to make it um, workable. But actually with the Bristol Housing Festival, we are um, looking at um, coming together as a, a wider Southwest region to, um, to create enough demand for modular. If we can get ourselves organized across all those local authority boundaries to have that scale of demand, then it becomes much more viable to, to put a factory in place. And we're, we're also part of the Western Gateway, um, uh, which is growing in prominence. So there's the Northern Powerhouse, the Midlands Engine, and now we have the Western Gateway, it stretches from Swansea to Swindon and from Gloucester to North Somerset. So we're a new economic partnership 
with Bristol and Cardiff at the centre. Uh, and hopefully that will give us the scale of demand um, that will make some of these kind of um, innovations uh, much more viable. Bristol is very historical and you're concerned about climate change and many old buildings are inefficient. Should we save them? Well, there's always those unintended consequences of, of old buildings and that they already have a load of carbon in them already. So there's carbon captured in them. You would, you would generate you know, carbon to knock them down and new carbon to build new buildings. Before you know it, the benefits of knocking them down have quickly been eclipsed. Um, so, no, I mean, I, there are other things that we can do, such as decarbonizing energy. Right? If we decarbonize energy, then we can use energy in those buildings, uh, you know, um, more safely in terms of planetary safety. Um, and, and we, you know, we don't, we, we want to, we want to preserve our heritage. It's actually important. It's an important quality, you know, of our life as well. So uh, we should save them. But again, that's what you guys are here for in part, isn't it, right? developing all these new technologies um, to decarbonize our systems and to, to, to work out how we how we manage our old buildings uh, much more effectively. Yeah, definitely. Um, what percentage can be retrofitted and who should pay for this? That's really difficult for us to, to quantify, um, but because we need, to, that's a big piece of work. Uh, but this is where government need, this is where we would say to government, come forward, um, because there are jobs in this, right? This is a time when we, the, I, I think um, government need to do the stuff to help us generate jobs. And if we can generate those jobs in uh, making our buildings more efficient in part, then that's fantastic. Um, so local authorities have been stretched for the last decade, to be put it mildly. Um, uh, so, yeah, but I think there's a great opportunity, but very difficult for us to say without a full round study. Uh, so I, I want to work in the public sector because I believe it is more accountable to the people that live in a place. Is that right? Um, in, in some ways, yes. Um, it, 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 the question of accountability is a real strange one because it also depends on the quality of political debate and the um, uh, I, um, and the qual and, and now I say the quality of journalism <laughs> and, and social media as well. Um, so it, it, on its on its face, clearly, uh, the democratic organisations are the most easily accessible to be um, held to account. I would say though, don't don't trap yourself solely in the in the public sector. You know, it, it's good to be really multidimensional. It's important that we understand each other. So, when we started working with um, developers, and I don't come from a development background, I worked in the BBC, and then I worked, I worked in a voluntary sector, worked in the health service. <clears throat> I, I think when you go into any conversation, the important thing is to understand where people are coming from. We live in a society today where if people don't, and this is a social media problem, I think in part, if people don't understand someone, they just make the assumption that they're evil. And, and there are some people like that in my realm of politics, any developer, anyone who's trying to build buildings is just evil, All right? We've got to work out what they need. So we said to developers, look, you, you're a company, you've got to make a return, we recognize that. We're a city, we want affordable housing. So how can we have a conversation at the earliest possible time so that you get what you want and need, and you do need that as a company, and we get what we want and need? Uh, as a city let's have the chat let's just be growing up about it and uh, and hopefully that's been part of the thing that's created a culture in which people want to work with us um so i i would say go into the public sector it's absolutely fantastic to do that but but be open to having some experiences in the private sector so you understand that world firsthand uh, um, at, at, you know at the same time uh, it, i think it would just add to your value thanks uh do you think companies are more efficient in the public or private sector? Oh, I don't know. That's a difficult one. I, I think there's a lot of myth about the inefficiency of the public sector. Now, now they, you know, there are sources of truth in it. Um, but I'll tell you, when I was at the BBC, right, I shouldn't, maybe I, I'm not doing them any favours, but People would print, they would, you say to someone, have you got that phone number? They type it, print the page and give you a piece of A4 with a phone number on it. 
I mean, and the bin at the end of the day was stacked with colored paper, by the way, with all the chemicals on it. I mean, big organizations can suck up inefficiency. A local authority, we have to be phenomenally, um, people would say the public sector is, you know, local government is not efficient. And we do find inefficiencies. At the same time, think about the multiplicity of challenges we take on. We're having to try and drive the economy while recruiting foster families, you know, while taking care, you know, you know while, while filling potholes, while advocating for the city and the regional economy on the international stage, while shaping national government policy. Well, you know, I mean, with, there's so many things go on on a, very, on a relatively small financial base. It's absolutely um, in, in, incredible. Um, I, I just say be the just. It's difficult for me to say, uh, but just be the kind of manager yourself that really drives for 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 real delivery. Okay, uh, so so COVID nineteen has massively affected our city, and people cannot afford to pay their rents and mortgages. How are you planning to help? Well, I just got off the phone this morning. We had a cabinet meeting, and uh, we're we're setting up a COVID recovery uh, fund. We are um, part of a, uh, a whole range of cities. Uh, in fact, that includes Gordon Brown's working on this as well. This, this really urging government to, um, to protect jobs, to keep people in employment um, in the first instance. Uh, the danger is that we go into an economic depression in which people fall out of employment and then we try and get them back in. That's a very expensive way of doing it. Um, it's all expensive but you end up with the mental health consequences of people losing their jobs, the family instability and all the other public services that kick in when um, societies and families begin to fall apart as they, as they do during economic um, depressions. So we're urging government to uh, keep people um, in employment as, as, much, as much as we can. And as I said, we, we're urging government to bring forward that investment so we can um, support jobs. But it's gonna be a challenge in Bristol. Um, you know, if unemployment goes up to 10%, that's looking like 20 odd, uh, about 23, 24,000 people. And we know that that will not land equally across Bristol. We've already seen growth in unemployment disproportionately high in Avonmouth, Lawrence Weston, uh, Lawrence Hill, Hartcliffe, all the usual areas you, you'd expect it um, uh, to be happening. So um, it's going to be a massive uh, challenge for us. Yeah. Oh, sorry, if I can just say the other thing we're doing is we're not doing it alone as a local authority. So every Wednesday at 12.30, I have a city leaders call. Heads of the universities, police, uh, business west, trade unions, voluntary sector, schools. So we've got this regular rhythm in Bristol now where the, there's about 15 to 18 leaders of the most prominent organisations in the city come together to acknowledge, recognise and try and develop solutions to, um, to uh, key city challenges. Okay. Great, thanks. Uh, so what, what is the future for students living and studying in Bristol? Well, right now, it looks like a, a very challenging one. Um, the, the, our COVID cases, are, are may, uh, our numbers are really coming through the student uh, population. Uh, um, interestingly, just so you know, it's not necessarily being transmitted through university life, like in terms of teaching, because those environments are really uh, pretty COVID secure, it's living. And that's where the virus is being transmitted in those everyday social interaction living environments. So that's where it's happening. Having said that, the universities are managing it very well. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's challenges of living in halls and getting food for anyone that is locked down, but they've had a plan in place for a long time to enable students to come back and it was responding uh, to this. Um, so at the moment, it's gonna be a challenge. Uh, in terms of the economy, that depends on how Bristol fares. I, I think Bristol's economy is pretty resilient. It will take a hit. We, we've lost 8,000 jobs in the city already. I mean, we have 8,000 fewer jobs, um, but so it will take a hit, but I think compared to other parts of the country that, that will fare pretty well. So for students coming out of university looking for work, this will probably one of the, be one of the best parts of the country um, to be in. Thanks. Um, so what good changes has COVID-19 brought to Bristol that you would like to keep? So right, we find out who we are during times of trial, right? And what's been quite amazing is um, to, to, to see how the city's been able to come together and work for common aims. It's, real, it's really built a, a camaraderie. 
for any of you to play sport, you know, it's like it's in battle that your team is built, isn't it? Right. <laughs> so, um, so we, you know, we've we've had a fantastic food distribution network in the city. Um, it's been quite phenomenal to see. It. We'd already done a lot of work on child hunger, but that then oriented towards just making sure that families didn't um, didn't go without food. So um, it's been amazing to to see that the number of volunteers that we've seen come forward. Over four thousand people registered for the for the Can Do Bristol website um, again, which is really quite. Um, uh, special to see. There are a few um, practical things as well that, that we've tried to capture. One is the um, improved air quality. So we've taken the opportunity to close, well, Busgate Bristol Bridge and close Bolden Street through traffic, pedestrianise the old city. That's because government put money up for active travel, so we're able to bring that through. Um, if we can keep that in place, then we won't have to charge. Yeah, um, so, so basically the option is we have to deliver compliant air. We have to introduce clean air zones that charge non-compliant vehicles. But if we can deliver clean air through changes to the way the traffic movements around the city that we've introduced, then we won't have to go down the charging route, which we're very concerned about because of the impact on low income families and businesses during the biggest depression. So we want to avoid charging if we, um, if we can. Um, and I think too, th I mean this, right? So city leaders travel a lot right there's a lot of miles put on the clock and you have to be there and um i think this sort of this will enable us to um uh reduce the amount of travel miles that we, that we put in which means being at home a lot more being in the city and um reducing the burden of our jobs on the planet so you partly answered this question just then, but our city is polluted. How are you working to encourage active travel in Bristol? Yeah, so we we I guess we took we took advantage of the money that was released from government that was brought through quickly to, uh, like I say, pedestrianise the old city, close Baldwin Street, restricting access to Bristol Bridge. Um, we've put um, widened pavements and cycle lanes in, around the city. It's not pretty at the moment because it's them red and white bollards, because it, it, these are temporary, meanwhile, interventions while we test how they impact uh, on, on the city movements. And, and we've worked with our partners. As I say we have this leaders call to really encourage people to, uh, you know, be, you know to, put, to switch to active travel options, walking and cycling. We recognize that's not for everyone, um, but we've uh, really, really um, uh, tried to do that. But you have to remember though, again, the, the, the thing we remind people, the generators of carbon aren't just cars. People go that a lot. It's actually data as well. Data centers are huge emitters of carbon right now. Um, and all of our, of our digitization is having an impact as well. We have to, it's a way we have, to, we have to think about that challenge too. Yeah. So how can we have a voice in Bristol's future? Um, like this, there, there are formal and informal ways. So the, we've developed something called the Bristol One City Plan, um, which was us bringing the city together to, to make a statement about where we wanted to be in 2050, right? So a friend of mine is in the army, I share this story a lot. He says, make a plan, any plan, just make a bloody plan, all right? In Bristol, we had no plans like for the city. Beyond, we actually did a piece of work where we got the city together, we do these things called the city gatherings, and um, <clears throat> we got all the prominent organizations to identify their existing strategies, right? This is, this is managing billions of pounds worth of organizations. In 2017, we saw there were very, very few strategies that went beyond 2022. So we were planning for like five years. So we said, no, we've got to have a longer term view on that. So we went for 2050. Now that plan, the One City Plan, has a, a an email link to these six strands that make up the plan: health and well-being, homes, communities, transport, education, environment, and economy. You could take that plan as a group. You could look over it, and you could email any comment you want on those strands. So each strand identifies three aims every year up to 2050. You can make a comment on that. You could also attend uh, full council meetings and cabinet meetings and make statements and ask questions. I'd encourage you to do that actually, but particularly when papers are coming to cabinet um, that are to do with city regeneration. 
so you'd be welcome. And then obviously think too about your own futures, um, you know, through the universities, through your organizations, um, about taking the, taking the opportunity to take those platforms and positions that give you a public voice. Mm -hmm. So what is the housing sector doing to increase diversity? Uh, well, I'd point out Carl Brown, actually. He's a lawyer at Clark Wilmot. He's been doing quite a bit. And he's a property lawyer. He's a partner now, actually. He's done very well. Um, and he's been doing a lot on trying to recruit people into construction on the legal side, and um, particularly but in construction in general. Um, there was a, there's a program in Bristol called On Sites that was trying to get more diversity um, um, onto the sites um, a, as well. Um, but I, I, we, we, just to let you know as well, we run a program in Bristol called um, Stepping Up. Um, first year, it was around black and minority ethnic people. Um, and then the second year is women and disabled people. So it's expanded out to those groups who often get stuck um, on the trajectory, the career trajectory and giving them a year of mentoring and support. Amazingly, 60% of the people that have done it have gone on to get promotions. Uh, which is which is phenomenal, and it's a program that's being copied in other parts of the country now. Um, so, I mean, but the, but the housing sector as a whole, I think there is a recognition of the need to to bring diversity into the organisations. Not just, and I really I was at pains to point this out, not just because it's a nice thing to do or because it's good social justice, but accessing the diversity of thought makes your organisation more dynamic, more innovative. Um, it's worth having a look up actually for all of you. McKinsey wrote a report a number of years ago called Diversity Matters, and I'd really recommend it. And it says that if you look at commercial companies, that and McKinsey's not some kind of bleeding heart, you know, do good at this is a global consultancy and all that. But companies that employed women in leadership were, were about eight, 15 to 18 percent more likely to outperform the market. Companies that had minorities in there as well were about 28 percent. So McKinsey say, so get, get, get with the program. You either start recruiting a diversity of thought or you're going to get left behind. And I think the more and more private sector companies are recognizing that and making efforts, um, but they don't quite know what to do. So, um, you know, we're trying to, uh, trying to work with them. But then look at what we're on now, Regeneration Brainery. This is part of it too. Um, you know, the, the, the companies and the sectors need to help in hand. And this is a fantastic example of that too. The Brainery introduces us to mentors. Have you ever had a mentor? Uh, I've always wanted to have a mentor, but I've not quite had one. The closest I got, the closest I got was a guy I met at Yale University, a very clever guy, uh, David Berg. He's a psychologist. And um, he said things to me, we just, it struck up a friendship and he has said really amazing things to me over the years really insightful things um and i took that but um i've never been able to sustain it i don't know <laughs> i've never found the right person but i recommend you all do it if you can particularly at your age and and i'll tell you one thing i did try and set someone up once i i, I say take a risk if if there's someone in the sector that you just think yeah i'd love to know how they managed to get to where they got to learn about them just go away and do a bit of research and then write them a letter, evidence that you've actually taken the time to learn about them. Tell them how impressed you are about their journey. Tell them you'd like to know how they did it and see what they say. See if they'd be up for, for spending some time chatting to you. I bet you most people would be like, wow. You know, it doesn't matter how rich and famous people become. You know, that kind of personal feedback will probably make them feel very special and valued. And they might say, yeah, well, why not? I'll give you a call. If the call goes somewhere, then you've got yourself an ally too. Even if they're not a mentor, they could just be an ally. Does the local authority have mentoring programs we can apply for? Yeah, we, we've done uh, Bristol Works, uh, which has mainly been about work experience uh, for children. So that then maybe not um, uh, directly for you. There's, there's Kickstarter, uh, which, is, uh, which, is, which is part of our one city approach that's being developed now, which is, reaching out to businesses and trying to connect them to 16 uh, to 25 year olds. And we are, we are checking on how the apprenticeship levy can be made more flexible uh, for us uh, within Bristol um, in, you know, as well. Um, but look, what, what we could do is, 
for for you guys and we could stay in touch when we are hosting our gatherings of people in the sector we could just have some of you come along and then you're there and we could point you out i've thought we've done this a few times in say we did this when we were bidding for channel four in bristol the channel four people you know, like alex mann who's the chief exec came down and i had young people with me right and just introduced them to her and they met the chief executive channel four you know sometimes it goes somewhere sometimes it doesn't but we'd be more than happy to create the conditions for you to meet people in the sector does the local authority have apprenticeship schemes how do we apply uh well i've just been through a few a few then uh, i can send you a full list through my office so after this we can get that email to you with a link to all the apprenticeship schemes that we we have going how are you encouraging apprenticeships across all industries in bristol well um we we put these on our website um, and just encourage graduates and uh companies and apprenticeships um uh, within the more normal fabric of you know of the city what I would say to you as well is um, it'd be great to hear from you what you would like from Bristol and how the city could be made to work for you because that kind of input can actually be fed in to our economy board and um, they've just written the um, economic regeneration strategy so you tell us how we can make the city work for you how we, this can be a place in which your talents and abilities can be given every opportunity it deserves to flourish and they can build that into the structure. I can take that to the combined authority, uh, to what we do here, my city leaders call, and we'd love to hear. Why don't you co-design the city with us? <laughs> do you have graduate placements? How do we apply? Uh, I'd have to check. So it's, you apply through our website. I'm not sure which ones are live at the moment, but all the graduate placements will be um, listed on our, our website. But again, our, our, our guys can, um, if we do a follow-up after, we can share that link with you. Marvin, on behalf of Regeneration Brainery, we, we want to thank you for spending your lunchtime with us. We have shared this on Regeneration Brainery's Facebook page. If anyone would like to watch it again, thank you very much, Marvin. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Hi all again, thank you so much to you all. Thank you, Marvin, of course, and thank you to the Brainies. There were some interesting questions there. I think Marvin did pretty well, and I think he, he pushed back on you guys as you guys are the future, clearly. So he's looking for your new technologies that you're going to be inventing. He's looking for leadership in the green arena. And you know, it's interesting, you know, Bristol is clearly doing so much uh, in terms of trying to fight inequalities. And um, he's clearly invited you to get involved. So I absolutely love that. And I know your regeneration brain, we will follow that up. And I think you guys should get involved in the city plan. And I think, you know, you are the future. You've got all the opportunities. And clearly, you know, Marvin has a very busy job. Um, I liked his advice of getting involved with the private sector as well as the public sector. And I know a number of people in our industry that have found that so valuable to really get experience with developers and private sector before moving into the public sector. Um, and it works very, very well. So as much experience as you can possibly get, I think that's, that's all very good advice. So thank you. Well done to you all. And you weren't the youngest people, I think, that Marvin has spoken to this morning as he's been involved with the primary school. So there's no. diversity for you and a cabinet meeting. So wow. 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 OK, well, thank you again to all of you. Have a good day and we'll follow up. Marvin, thank you. Really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And from us at Movers and Shakers, we thank you all for engaging. We support the Bristol Housing Festival, of course, and Regeneration Brainery. And if you want any information on these organizations, we can pass them on to you. In terms of Movers and Shakers next virtual event, November the 6th, we've got a webinar on estate regeneration. On November the 10th, we're gonna be launching the results of the fantastic Park Power Initiative that the London Collective has been doing with the Commonplace. Um, absolutely fantastic thousands of people voting across London on what they prioritize for their green spaces and parks and what they see for the future so that's going to be a really great event and there's going to be a special guest video calling in so watch this space thank you very much have a good day take care from our family to yours goodbye